How much of our atmosphere has lost to space and should we actively be replenishing it? Is there an exact copy of Earth out there hiding in the universe? Can we use the sun to send messages? And in our extended Q&A plus version, how will the advancements in AI change astronomy? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. David, is there any scientific basis to the three body problem book series use of the sun and stars as a radio wave giga amplifier? Sort of. So in the three body problem, uh, the main character, I forget her name. Anyway, she um, realizes that she can use the sun as a way to send messages and receive messages and uses that to sell out planet Earth to the Tristellarans. And so there is a version of this idea, and that is the solar gravitational lens that if you go out to about 550 astronomical units away from the sun, you can use the sun as a natural telescope lens that is 10s of 1000s of times more powerful than anything you could build in orbit around the Earth. And so if you could actually get a telescope out to that point, then you could use the, the solar gravitational lens to see a megapixel resolution image of an exoplanet, and so on. Now people have suggested that the solar gravitational lens in addition to providing a really powerful, wonderful telescope might also provide a way that uh, advanced civilizations could communicate with one another that they go out to the to the gravitational lens of each one of their stars, and then they can have the 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 destination star in the crosshairs of the solar gravitational lens, and then they can send a targeted transmission at that star. And because the light is being focused by the star, then you can achieve a much higher bandwidth. Like the problem when you send any kind of radio communication out into space is that the bandwidth gets very low because the beam spreads out and you get like really low uh, transmission rates. When you think about say, um, the New Horizon spacecraft, when it was out at Pluto, and it was taking pictures of Pluto, it was sending back data at bits per second. And you know, not kilobits per second, bits per second. And it took 18 months for the the flyby of Pluto by New Horizons for it to take all of the pictures and, and image and data all that it had taken. It took 18 months for it to get all of that information back home. And now there have been proposals for putting say lasers on spacecraft, we see that with the psyche mission. So instead of sending a radio signal with a big transmitter, you send a, a tight beam with a laser, and that gives much higher bandwidth. But even that is going to have its limitations over vast distances. And so it might be that the only way to maintain coherence between some kind of you know, galactic federation, the empire is that you have these receiver transmitters set up at the solar gravitational lens pointing at all of the different other stars in the empire. And then you are sending data back and forth between these stars in a constant basis at high bandwidth, thanks to the power of the solar gravitational lens. And in fact, Slava Tershev uh, wrote about this is a in one of these scientific papers about the solar gravitational lens that you might be able to, to to see uh, and intercept communications coming from uh, civilizations communicating with each other through this methodology. Jeff Miller, does our atmosphere evaporate into space? If so, is there an infinite replacement? Yeah, we are losing atmosphere to space. Um, we're gaining about 100 tons of debris from space, meteorites crashing into the Earth and, and collecting into our atmosphere. And we're losing about the same uh, from gas escaping from the Earth. And is it being replenished? No, it's not. The Earth's atmosphere is slowly bleeding off into space. But it will last a lot longer than the life of the sun. So even though it is not being replenished, I mean, it is kind of being replenished through the carbon cycle through oxygen, you know, various uh, creatures on Earth, but the you know, the molecules that are being lost to space are not coming back. Uh, but it, you know, won't have an effect over the entire lifetime of the planet Earth. Ghost Dog 4, any opinions on precursors indicating Betelgeuse has really started to go supernova? So we don't know when Betelgeuse is going to go supernova, but it is in the final stage of being a red supergiant star. And so it's likely to go supernova sometime in the next 100,000 ish 
years. Um, but it could go it could have already gone off and we're waiting for the light to reach us, it might not go off for another 100,000 years, and then the 640 years for the light to reach us and we just don't know. Now there was a paper that came out about a year ago, where some scientists were proposing that, uh, that there are certain reactions that are going on inside Betelgeuse that might indicate that is further along the fusion chain that, you know, the very last thing that a star does is it starts to create iron in its core. And then that leads to the death of the star and the collapse and the implosion that leads to the black hole and the supernova. But before that, there are other kinds of fusion that are that are happening at, at lower energies that are more massive than the hydrogen and helium, but less massive than the precursors to iron. And that those fusion reactions don't last long, probably just a couple of years before you then get to where you're trying to fuse iron. So we could be in that sort of final stage. But then other people are very skeptical of that research. And so I think we just have to go back to we have no idea when Betelgeuse is going to explode. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above Brian Vera, Daniel, John Herman, Rick T137, Greg Feely, Rye Guy, Ashok Batia, Stefan Yaknow, Rick Stokes, and Scott Winnegath. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. PMG Corey. James Webb finds impossible mature galaxies in the early universe challenging our cosmology. How must we rethink dark matter, dark energy, and early galaxy formation and what new theories are emerging? When James Webb first made its observations, it absolutely found examples of galaxies that appear to be overly mature that they were, it's sort of surprising that there would be this much galaxy this early. And yet, now that we are three years into the observations with James Webb, and astronomers have been able to use the most powerful tools with James Webb, especially its ability to do spectroscopy on these galaxies, we're getting a much better picture of what is out there. And it's coming a lot more in line with the existing theories about the cosmology of the universe. The thing that is definitely becoming more and more interesting is that, you know, it does appear that the supermassive black holes at the hearts of galaxies formed a, a lot earlier, and maybe more directly than this sort of bottom ups, you know, small black holes are finding each other merging into larger ones and larger ones. And eventually, you get the supermassive black hole. I mean, there are bl supermassive black holes seen within the first 500 million years of the universe with uh, millions of times the mass of the sun and like the math just doesn't hold. But there are alternative ways that you can get black holes that big that maybe that first generation of stars when they detonate you know, they because they're made of pure hydrogen and helium, they don't have limits about how big they can get. And maybe you could, you could get much larger black holes as remnants. Uh, or maybe that if you have enough material in a area that is compact enough, and there's some kind of cooling process, some way to manage the heat, you could get a direct collapse of an entire black hole. We are seeing examples of stars that appear to have just disappeared. And so maybe they're just going directly into black holes, and they're actually turning into supernova. So there's a lot of really interesting ideas. And, you know, I think that there are people who are proposing alternative theories of the universe, uh, that they're facing a lot of skepticism from the existing scientific community. But when scientists are expressing surprise at the kinds of galaxies that they're seeing, then this is a chance for these alternative theorists to jump in and try to push their theory, you know, people have a have an open mind at this point to alternative theories of cosmology. And yet, you know, these are theories that they've been pushing for decades. And there's no observational evidence for what it is that they're saying. And yet this is a, you know, they are marketing, they're using this opportunity where we are, you know, these first initial uh, observations as a chance to market their own personal theories. And now that the scientists have had access to this telescope for three years, have done 1000s of observations, released 1000s of papers, a much more clear, complete picture is emerging. And it is fully in line with the existing theories about the universe. But the most interesting stuff is the stuff around the edges, the specifics, the details, how those first galaxies came together. What are the little red dots? How do you get black holes that are that big that early? When did the dark ages 
shut off? And what was the mechanism that did that? What is the cause for varying kinds of, of heated gas that we see in the early universe? So these are the kinds of details that astronomers were hoping to get answers to. And James Webb is actually doing that. Uh, when it comes to things like dark, dark matter, dark energy, uh, no change has been made to either of those based on these observations. So you know, there are going to be some amazing ideas that overturn our existing ideas about cosmology in the universe. But they are not as sort of uh, flying and fast and furious as I think a lot of people have been trying to lead others to believe. So uh, be patient and enjoy the, the mystery as it unfolds. GT Ziavalis. If the universe is infinite or just finite and off the scale big, is it fair to say that there's an Earth out there somewhere identical to ours except ruled by the flying spaghetti monster instead? So this idea that there is sort of repeat or like anything possible is out there in the universe comes from the idea that there's a finite number of configurations that that matter and energy can take in the universe that if you had a, a cubic meter of space, then there is a finite number of configurations of all of the the quantum fluctuations that can happen within that cubic meter, you can do the math and it's like 10 to the power of 80 different configurations that that cubic meter can contain. And it's an enormous number. But if we do live in an infinite universe, then if you go far enough, then you're eventually going to get repeats, you know, there was one of uh, you know, one cubic meter of space where it was was this configuration. And then there was another one out there. And it's exactly the same as that other one. And then after a while, the farther you go, the more repeats you get, and then eventually you get repeats of two square meters and four square meters and eight square meters, and eventually you get entire other Earths. And so eventually, there's going to be another place out there in the universe where someone is giving a chat on whatever is their version of YouTube, and everything is exactly identical to to here on Earth, um, it would appear to be perfect in every way. And, and not only is this happening, but this is happening an infinite number of times and every possible variation is also happening as well. And so this is this idea of having a multiverse within the universe, just as a result of an infinite amount of volume of space, you could also get infinite through time that if the future of the universe is infinite, and that at some point quantum fluctuations will reconfigure atoms into new forms, that eventually you're going to get those repeats of those cubic meters of space, but into time. And so there's sort of two dimensions that infinity causes multiverses within our existing universe, you don't even have to go to other universes to have uh, other versions of yourself, they're just so far away that you could never actually reach them. But the question that you're asking is, would there be a planet that is ruled by the flying spaghetti monster? And the problem is, is that you need to have things that are possible. So you know, could you have another planet with horses? Yes. Could you have another planet with unicorns? No, you know where they're uh, you cut off their horn and their blood heals. I forget. I forget what unicorns can do. Um, you know, could you have Pegasus? No, right? Because they, they can't fly, right? A horse would be incapable of flying. So you can only have the things that are possible. And I mean, I'm as much of a fan as the flying spaghetti monster as anyone as any atheist, but uh, it's not possible. And so no, you're not going to get a flying spaghetti monster out there uh, that is ruling over a planet. Now you could have whatever is the most possible version of the flying spaghetti monster. So you could imagine a world where it's exactly like ours. And yet everybody is, you know, their religion is the flying spaghetti monster, then yes, that would be possible. But to actually have a flying spaghetti monster? No, ramen. Lance Herring, is it a proven fact that black holes do not suck in matter and shoot out dark matter through the other side? Well, the problem with the black hole is that there isn't another side that a black hole is a sphere, or you know, the event horizon of a black hole is a sphere. And so instead of it being a hole, you sort of imagine you're walking along, and you see a hole in the ground, and you throw stuff in the hole, where does the hole go? But a black hole, when you think about the gravity of a black hole, it's a lot more like thinking about the gravity of planet Earth, you walk around, you know, around the entire Earth, and you're being held to the surface of the Earth because of the gravity. And so the same thing that a black hole twists, uh, affects space time, causes this distortion in space time that causes mass to be attracted to it, or I guess mass thinks it's following a straight line. But anyway, the point is that it goes in three dimensions. And there is no exhaust port 
on a black hole. There is no other side to a black hole. If you go into the event horizon of a black hole, you get added to the mass of the black hole. Um, you know, some people propose that or, you know, Hawking has calculated that black holes will evaporate over long periods of time, but it's definitely not the source of dark matter that's coming from them. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question is all about advancements in AI that will change astronomy. And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had for this episode. Thank you everyone who put your questions into the YouTube comments and a big thanks to everybody who joined me for the live show. I record the show live every Monday at 5pm. Uh, sometimes it's specific time, sometimes it's in Europe, sometimes it's in Asia. Uh, so you'll have to check and see when the next version of the show is but it's two hours long, we get to like 100 questions in the show. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So definitely check that out if you can. Now I'm going to shout out some more channels. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bailey Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hans Schultz, Hudson Ward, Jay Graves, James Clark, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Modso, Paul Robach, Rank Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Menley, Vlad Chaplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. All right, as I like to do, I'm going to try and shout out a bunch of channels that have less subscribers than me. And uh, hopefully you will go and subscribe to their channels and bring them more more views. So uh, first up, I want to direct you to Chris Benton Astronomy, and he only has 345 subscribers. And uh, he gives talks in astronomy in New Zealand. And they're about an hour long and in front of an audience, but he records the talks. And so you know, it's a variety of interesting topics for uh, like a public audience. So you should definitely go and check that out. Next up is Chris Patterson, and he works with the University of Portsmouth Cosmology. And he's got a series of videos where he is explaining stuff in space and astronomy. Like, for example, a recent video he did was whether you could point web at Earth and like what kind of resolution could you see? But of course, you shouldn't because it would be bad for web's optics. But still, if you could, what would you see? And last up, I want to shout out another Fraser. And this is Fraser Gunn. And he only has 1100 subscribers. And he is an astrophotographer and most recently has been doing a bunch of time lapse videos of auroras and they're beautiful. So definitely go and check that out. All right, so please keep your recommendations for smaller space astronomy science channels that I can go and give a shout out here for my channel. All right, we'll see you next time.